you are not an afterthought. I'm Reverend Anderson T. Gray, the second pastor of Bailey Tabernacle CME Church in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And today I want to give you a word to the wise, a discussion about why black history is Christian history. If you look at the historical path and the biblical path, what we have often been taught in American history is that Christianity began in Jerusalem, went to Rome, spread to Europe, and then over a thousand years later, Europeans brought the gospel to Africa. But that's not true. The African peoples were not an afterthought to Christ. They were not an afterthought to God. Let's go all the way back, back to the beginnings of what we can think of as the lineage of black people. In the Bible, Noah, who was the patriarch who brought us through the flood, had three sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. And tradition holds that Ham was the progenitor of what we think of as the African peoples. And there is a lot of racialized mishistory attached to Ham. One idea is that Ham was outside of God's covenant. But when you look at what the Bible says, in Genesis 9 verses 8 and 9, God made a covenant specifically with Noah and his sons, all of them. This covenant was with Noah, his sons, and all of their descendants, meaning God's covenant after the flood was not with a certain chosen group of people, but it was with all of humanity, including black people. Ham's descendants, according to the Bible, were the ancestors, the patriarchs, the founders of civilizations like Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, Foot or Put, and Mesopotamia. These were the great civilizations that began human civilizations. When you map out where Ham's descendants were and where they began their lives and built their cultures, you see the beginnings of human civilization. So if there's something wrong with black people, there's something wrong with all of us. Even when you go back to Eden, and yes, Eden is lost and the geography of where it exactly was is, is impossible to tell. But when you look at what the Bible says, and you look at the locations, the, the landmarks that mark the land of Eden, where our father Adam and our mother Eve were, then you see names that are attached to the descendants of Ham. You see Cush, you see Assyria, you see Euphrates, you see Havala, you see Sheba, you see places which, according to the Bible, contained, e, contained Eden and were in the bosom of Ham, the father of black folks. Even the name for Egypt, which Europeans have tried to sort of separate from the rest of Africa. The original name, what Egyptians called themselves before colonizations, is the name Kemet, which means black. Black people have always been part of the story of God. Throughout the Bible, you see names that are equivalent to African peoples and people groups. You see names like um, Cush and Ethiopia, when you read the histories, because we didn't standardize um, names until much later on in our history, you see Nubia and Axum and Axum. Sometimes these are the same civilizations. Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes they're separate places. But they are all the ancestral home of black civilizations, of Africans. Africans and black peoples have always been part of God's story. Even when you get to the, the codification of what we think of as Israel, black people were there. The book of Numbers chapter 12 says that Moses' second wife, we don't know what happened to his first wife, we don't know if she died or they separated or this was polygamy, but it does say that Moses' second wife, Numbers chapter 12, was an Ethiopian woman. Some translations of the Bible say a Cushite woman. In other words, Moses married a black girl. And this was while Israel was in the wilderness, which means that when 
God brought Israel out of Egyptian slavery. There were people, not only from North Africa and Egypt, but people from throughout the African continent, black and brown people, who came out of Egypt with Israel as part of what Exodus chapter 12 calls a mixed multitude. So it wasn't just the ancestors of the Jews, the ethnic ancestors of Jews, but there were people from throughout Africa who were in the group that moved into the wilderness, who were there through the 40 years, who married into the highest echelons of Israelite culture and society, including Moses' own family. So when Israel came into the promised land, genetically, they brought black blood with them. That's what the Bible says. Even after that, when you look into the songs that were sung in the tabernacle, the songs that were sung in the first temple that Solomon built, those were the songs, many of them were the songs that Solomon's father, David, wrote and sang. One of them was Psalm, what we call Psalm 68, a Psalm of David, in which David prophetically sings about Egypt and Ethiopia, sings of them praising God, sings of them as part of God's people, part of God's worship. Hundreds, thousands of years before there was even any reference to Europeans in the pages of Scripture. In the first of God's temples, they sang of Africa. Just even logic. When you look in the stories of the interactions between the Israelite kingdom and the other nations of their world, you see references to Ethiopia, you see references to African nations, as well as Egypt and, and the North African nations. In fact, in 1 Kings 10, that famous story with the Queen of Sheba, who was the Queen of Ethiopia, when she comes to visit Solomon, it talks about how she brought him gifts, and some of those gifts in, in included gold that came from a trade agreement with a land called Ophir. Jewish tradition, ancient Jewish tradition, identifies Ophir as a location in India. And though later scholars sort of you know, disagree about where that actually might have been, the range of areas includes places like ancient Zimbabwe, Mozambique, or even Sri Lanka. In other words, it was somewhere either in deepest Africa or the farthest Far East. In ancient times, the Bible tells us there was trade, which means there was cultural exchange, which means there was an exchange of ideas and people and relationships between the people who had been entrusted with God's law and nations perhaps as far as India. God and his law. God and his word, the faith of God, has been throughout the world long, long, long before white folks started carrying the Bible as missionaries. And this idea, this idea that civilization was something that was absent from Africa until Europeans brought it, is again something that is contrary to the word of God. Because in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, there's this, this interesting story. Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, is king of Judah. And it says that during the time that he was reigning, he led Israel in a transgression against God. We're not told exactly what it was, but basically under Solomon's son's leadership, Israel, Judah in particular, drifted away from the Lord. And God sent someone, called a group of people to correct Israel. That group of people was a pan-African army that according to 2 Chronicles chapter 12 included 60,000 horsemen, 1,200 tra chariots, and innumerable number of foot soldiers who came from nations like Egypt, Lubim, which is an old name for Libya, Sukkim, a North African area, and Ethiopia, which means God called 
a pan-African army to march into Jerusalem and force them to repent and come back to the Lord. And it says in 2 Chronicles 12, 5 and 6, even the king of Judah recognized that they were wrong. These African soldiers were right. And they humbled themselves and came back to God. God used African military might to make his people in Israel come back to him. Africa had great armies, great nations, great empires, great civilization, and not only individual exceptions, but a collective sense of the God of the Bible. And God knew his African children, spoke to his African children, moved them on large scales to execute his plan and to serve his will in a world that wasn't dark and wasn't devoid of civilization. African peoples have never been an afterthought to God. The prophet Isaiah, writing eight centuries before Christ, spoke of the remnant of God's people coming out of Assyria and Egypt and Pathros and Cush and Elam and Shinar and Hamath and the islands of the sea, which if you recall that map, are all lands associated with black ham. Our ancestors were an integral part of God's plan. And when the Lord spoke to his prophets in Israel, he made sure that they recorded that he was thinking about his children in Africa. That said, it was a complicated relationship. And it wasn't iso an isolated relationship. Some people would say that there were only glimpses and pieces of Christianity or, or, the, or the word of God at the very edges of Africa. But you see in Isaiah references to what was going on with God's people beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. In Zephaniah, it speaks of my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, bringing an offering from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia which is just the Old Testament way of saying sub-Saharan and Central Africa. Africa has always been part of God's plan. But like every nation, every culture, every people, their relationship with God is their relationship with the rest of the world. It's been complicated. It is a disservice to the truth to try to make it seem like Africa was cut off or ignored by God for all of his history. And it's also a disservice to the truth to try to make it seem like Africa has always and was always holy. That's not true of anybody, nobody. And so there are places in scripture, as we talked about, where it speaks of African cultural civilizations, kingdoms and kings serving God. But there are also many places in scripture and speak of Afri those same African empires and those same Middle Eastern empires going away from God and being punished for it, just like God punished Israel. Because whom the Lord loves, chastises. And he has always loved his African children. The nation of Ethiopia has one of the most well-documented and longest biblical histories outside of the land of Israel. There is a type of, a sect of, of Judaism that has been practiced in Ethiopia longer than Judaism in any other place outside of the land of Israel itself. The most common or the largest of those is they call themselves Beta Israel. Ethiopia's own national history, long before colonization, colonizers even attempted to make ground in Ethiopia, speaks of their, their lineage and connection with Judaism. Some lines of lineage talk about the tribe of Dan migrating to Ethiopia. Others refer to the sons of Moses. Remember, Moses had an Ethiopian wife. And others talk about perhaps the most famous part of Ethiopian history. is the story of Emperor Menelik, who was the son of Solomon and the queen of Sheba. But again, it is clear from history 
history that was preserved outside of and before the transatlantic slave trade. The peoples of Africa have a deep connection in the word of God. You are not an afterthought. And even when we move into the New Testament, the words that God had preserved in New Testament scripture remind us that this connection was not something that ended with the rise of the Roman Empire. In Acts chapter 2, the famous story, what we often call the birthday of the church on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles in the upper room with a mighty rushing wind and, and tongues of fire resting upon their heads, when Peter, that, that insecure, inconsistent fisherman, stood up and gave that powerful sermon, and hundreds and thousands were brought to faith in God. It says that in Jerusalem at that time, assembled for the feast, what we call Pentecost, or the Feast of Tabernacles, was this group of men, Jews, who were from every nation under heaven. Every nation under heaven. Not just the nations that were attached to the Roman Empire. Not just the nations that we think of as part of Europe today, but every nation under heaven. And when you look at what you may think of as a, 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 a role of nations there, there are 16 nationalities and ethnicities mentioned there. And when you look at those who heard the word of God on the day of Pentecost, they are all over the Middle East and Africa. The only of the some 16 nations that were identified on Pentecost who heard the gospel and received the gospel. Only one of them is in what we think of as Europe, Rome. Yes, God loves his European children. And Rome heard, Romans heard the gospel on the day of Pentecost. But they weren't the only ones who heard the gospel. It wasn't only Romans. It wasn't even mostly Romans. But Pentecost jump-started the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth by sending it all over the ancient world. And when they heard it, they didn't hear it only in Latin. They didn't hear the gospel only in Greek. They didn't have to give up their languages, but the Bible says the Holy Spirit empowered the apostles to speak in such a way that all those groups, all those ethnicities heard it in their own tongue, understood the mighty things of God in the context of their own culture, which means that from its birth, Christianity has been multicultural. From its birth, the Holy Ghost assigned the presentation of the gospel to go forth in a way that was culturally appropriate, or even as we want to say it today, culturally sensitive. And we would think that we remember how things were done on our birthday. But unfortunately, the history of the evangelism of the church, particularly in the Western church, has not remembered to speak in the language of the people they're talking to. But that was the way it was done in the early church. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 20, who was a Jew, talked about how he conformed himself to the cultural expectations of the people he was talking to. To the Jews, he spoke as a Jew. To those who were under the laws, those under the law. To those without the laws, without the law. To those who weren't as strong as he, he didn't force to tell them they had to get stronger, but to the weak, he became as weak. It was all things to all men. So he might say some. Because he understood that what was important was sharing Christ. It wasn't important to try to impose his culture. Paul and the other apostles didn't try to civilize the people they witness to. He knew those people didn't need civilization. They just needed Jesus. A lesson we ought to remember. We also ought to remember that when in the very earliest days of the church, the gospel was beginning to go forth into all the world, God made a special effort 
to make sure that the gospel made it to Africa. Besides those North Africans who were there at the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 8 tells us that the Lord sent an angel to Philip the Evangelist, one of the early apostles, and told him to go run off and to catch a man from Ethiopia, a man who had been in Jerusalem, had been worshiping, and was heading away. And when he found this man, the, um, the book of Acts says that Philip found him in his chariot reading the Bible, reading from Isaiah, which in those times, hundreds of years before the printing press, meant that somebody, he had a hand-scribed copy of Isaiah hand-scribed in the language of his own nation or hand-scribed in Hebrew, which means he spoke Hebrew, and he was an Ethiopian. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, they had Bible study. That man gave his life to Christ. And Philip baptized that Ethiopian man because God wanted to make sure that the gospel got to Ethiopia. You are not an afterthought. It's worth noting as well, the apostle Paul, who did so much for the spreading of the gospel to the Gentiles, the apostle Paul is converted on the Damascus road in Acts chapter nine, which means the Holy Ghost made sure the gospel made it to Ethiopia before it made it to Paul. You are not an afterthought. There is this historical myth that all churches are descended from the Roman Catholic Church. And as, as much as the Roman Catholic Church deserves the credit that is due to it, doesn't deserve all the credit for Christianity in the world. Because before Christianity became the religion of Rome, it was the religion of Armenia. Before Christianity became the religion of Rome, in 325 AD, it became the official religion of Ethiopia, which was known as the Axum, the Axum Empire at the time. And yes, there's this idea put forth, promoted, that Christianity became Rome's religion very early, but that's not true. Christians were given freedom of religion in 313 AD but it didn't become the religion of the Roman Empire until the Edict of Thessalonica in 381. So Rome wasn't the first Christian nation, wasn't even the second Christian nation. Ethiopia as a nation accepted Christianity half a century before it happened in Rome. Because remember what the Bible says. Jesus commanded his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. Not just the nations that were a part of the Roman Empire, all nations. And if there's any confusion, as Mark records, he told them specifically to go into all the world. And if that wasn't clear enough, he told them to go to the ends of the earth. And even though, for whatever reason, history often refers to Europeans like the Roman Caesars and Alexander the Great as men who conquered the world, they didn't see very much of the world at all. The area that they conquered was nowhere near the whole world. The gospel went farther than Alexander ever traveled. The gospel went farther than any of the Caesars even imagined because that's what Jesus told his disciples to do. There's a figure, an important figure in the Bible. His name is John Mark. John Mark was there when, when Peter got out of prison. Matter of fact, when the angel brought Peter out of prison, the house he went to was John Mark's mama's house in Acts 12. Um, John Mark was a protege of Peter, or one of his disciples. Um, tradition says that Peter was the one who baptized him. But 1 Peter 5, 13, he refers to, Peter refers to Mark as his spiritual son. John Mark did two important things. He wrote the Gospel of Mark, 
which is the first and oldest gospel to be published. And he founded the Church of Egypt, which was not a branch of the Roman Catholic Church, but the Coptic Church of e Egypt was founded by John Mark, an author of the Gospels, in 42 AD. 42 AD. Jesus was about 33 when he was crucified. So this is, by some counts, less than a decade after the crucifixion and resurrection, when there was a church, official church, in Egypt. And the Coptic church was not the church of the Roman Empire, it was not the church of the Roman elites, but the reason it's known as the Coptic church is because from its very beginning, the religious, the liturgical language of the church of Egypt was Coptic, not Latin, not Greek, Coptic, which was the language of the common people, which means it was everybody's church. Africa had a church before England had a church before Rome had a church, before Europe had the church, it was in Africa. And it was an African church. In fact, when you look at the histories of the Coptic church, the Coptic church has a history which tells us that the gospels are tied to Africa. The introduction to the book of Luke is a letter addressed to most excellent Theophilus. And the Coptic church's history, long before you had the transatlantic slave trade, states that Theophilus was a Jew of Alexandria. In fact, the founder of the Methodist tradition, John Wesley, wrote in one of his commentaries an affirmation that Theophilus was from Alexandria. Alexandria being an ancient city in Egypt. The Gospels. The church, the organized church, was in Africa long before colonization of Europe, the slave trade. The churches in Africa developed in most cases before the church in Europe, after a while in conjunction with the Roman church, but always, always with their own history, their own culture. Africans are not an afterthought to the gospel. You are not an afterthought to God. And when you step back from the sort of reflexive recall stats and, and so-called facts you've been taught, and you just think about it, it's obvious that Christianity is not a white man's religion. It's obvious that black and brown people are not an afterthought to God. It's obvious because, yes, Jesus commanded his disciples to go to the ends of the earth, not just to the limits of Europeans. In retrospect, it, you think about it, it, it doesn't even make sense that the disciples in Israel would leave and only go deeper into the Roman Empire that was the, that was the source of their political oppression at the time. It doesn't even make sense that the to think that the apostles only went deep into Europe and never went farther when Jesus had told them to go to the ends of the earth. It makes sense and it seems obvious when you think about it. Of course, Israel had ancient trade and cultural relationships with the peoples of Africa and what we think of as the Far East and Southeast Asia and beyond. Obviously, Israel sitting there on the Arabian Peninsula would have moved through the, the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea and had cultural exchanges with these people. And obviously, knowing that the Bible testifies that Solomon and, and the other ancient, Egypt, uh, ancient Israelite and Old Testament kingdoms were in relationship with one another all throughout Africa and the Far East. Obviously, when it was time to go to the ends of the earth, the apostles would not have 
confined their travels to the Roman Empire. It seems obvious when you think about it that they would have boarded the same ships that their ancestors had boarded, that they would have traveled the same routes that their ancestors traveled, that the apostles would have taken the Silk Road which moved through Galilee, that the apostles would have boarded those ships to Ophir, wherever that was. It seems obvious when you look at what happened in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Word of God has always been going to the people of the Middle East and Africa. That it wasn't first brought there by Europeans. Because the Bible says that God has always had relationship with all of his children. And yes, yes in our post-racial, post-segregation, post-slavery, post-everything American culture. We have this long tradition of scholars maintaining that God is white and Christianity is a product of Western civilization. But when you think about it, of course, that's what historians who are colonizers and slaveholders would say. Of course. That's what historians who had a vested interest or simply a subconscious bias to support that idea would say. But when you read the Bible, you see a truth that makes much more sense. You see Africa throughout the pages of scripture. You see the gospel being sent to places that did not become part of Europe, did not become part of the United States. You see, that you are not an afterthought to God, but you've always been in his heart. You've always been on his mind. Read your word. Ask the questions that need to be asked. Praise the Lord, because he loves you, and so do I. Have a good one. This is Reverend Anderson Graves. I want to thank you for listening, for giving your attention, and I want to thank you in advance for what you're going to do as you dig more deeply into this important information. Please remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Share what you've heard with somebody. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.